This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Will a new superintendent at CMS mean big changes at your kid's school? Well, maybe not. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around. We'll introduce you to Ernest Winston and take a closer look at why the latest shakeup at CMS might be different this time around. I'm Jason Terzis in the University City area. Coming up, we'll introduce you to a couple of CMPD officers who are making it their personal mission to bridge the communication gap between police officers and the people they serve. And meet student musicians discovering jazz through a unique program designed just for them. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. There's a new superintendent in charge of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. His name, Ernest Winston. And if you're a CMS parent or grandparent, or if you work for CMS, the school system is hoping you don't notice anything different. After years of CMS upheaval and controversy, the district and the new superintendent hope to keep the focus on progress and not on the past, not even the recent past. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier joins us in Charlotte with more. Hey, Jeff. You know, they say the more things change, the more they stay the same. Well, that pretty much describes this latest shakeup at Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. Yeah, there's a new superintendent, but that doesn't necessarily mean a lot of changes at CMS. In fact, the real question is, why did CMS make this change at the top? And who exactly is this new guy who got the job in the first place? <laughs> New superintendent Ernest Winston has never worked at any other system but CMS. He's certainly never been a superintendent before, but there were no town hall meetings with parents and teachers, no search committee looking for other qualified candidates, no competition at all, really. You know, so it makes the job uh, a little bit easier. Not easy. Uh, <laughs> that, I just want to be clear, it's, it's not an easy job. Uh, but it does make it a little bit easier uh, to be able to do the work and uh, knowing that you have the confidence uh, of your uh, school board. At CMS, though, getting the confidence of school board members is often different than keeping the confidence of school board members. That is correct. That is correct. One of the things that um, um, I know the board wanted to do was to make sure that we stabilize things in the system. Um, that does not, in my opinion, um, mean that we cannot disagree. I have nine bosses, uh, which is a unique uh, situation. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Educated in a small town. In a smaller district, one of the things I hadn't counted on was the deep personal relationships that you develop. Winston replaces Clayton Wilcox, who was a newcomer, an outsider, a successful small town superintendent who often butted heads with the same CMS school board that searched nationwide for him, found him, brought Wilcox to Charlotte two years ago, gave him a raise in January, then, you know, forced him out in July, and still hasn't told anyone publicly why but this is about moving forward, learning from the past in order to be able to correct and make some adjustments so that we can all move forward. You know, I, I'm, I'm happy that they went the route of uh, choosing me uh, because I do bring that experience of knowing the district. Um, I also bring the experience uh, as a parent in the district, which uh, is an exciting lens to, to be able to help uh, in my decision-making process. Winston joined CMS 15 years ago as a teacher at Vance High School. We dug up his old photos in the Vance yearbook. And before teaching, Winston was a newspaper reporter. And he often covered the same CMS budget battles and political pressures he'll soon be in the middle of as superintendent. One of the criticisms, I think, of the process that led to you being chosen is that the board found someone that they can, they can guide or, or control or manipulate. You don't see yourself as that kind of a person. Not at all. At the end of the day, I think what families care about the most is will my child get the best education possible? That's something that I am committed to. That's something that every member of my team is committed to. Um, and it's about the experience of all of our students. That student experience at some Charlotte-Mecklenburg schools versus others 
is another area of concern at CMS that former Superintendent Wilcox wasn't shy talking about. You know, as a final question before we run out of time. Here's an excerpt from our PBS Charlotte Town Hall on Education earlier this year. At low poverty high schools like Ardry Kell, CMS's own numbers show that in grades 9 through 12, more than 85% of white kids are considered college and career ready when it comes to English, which is pretty good. But in high poverty high schools like Geringer, it's a different story. The number of black and Hispanic students considered college and career ready in English, less than 25%. I was even more appalled when during the conversation that uh, we had with Dr. Wilcox, he stated that a degree or a diploma from R.J. Kale and Providence had more weight than a, a diploma from Garinger. We want to change that reality. But the new superintendent's not shy either, accepting responsibility for numbers that show schools struggling and students falling behind. I own that data. You know, I was not in the position at that time. I was not ultimately responsible, but I was on the team. Mm -hmm. um, and now I, you know, am the superintendent. You don't get the same clean slate that every new superintendent gets, is wow. what I'm trying to say. That's just the reality of the circumstances, mm -hmm. and, and I can't change that. I own the data. I own the results. And uh, it's my responsibility, along with the team that uh, I have in place, to improve outcomes for every child. And so I'm And very for clear Winston, about that. who has the kids of his own in CMS that. elementary and middle schools, that responsibility to make schools better and to make kids more successful isn't just a job, it's personal. Just as personal as the schools are to every CMS parent. The people in there are so warm-hearted and welcoming, and um, that's what I want for her. You change directions, so you know it's hard to it's just hard to get in the rhythm. Like you said, as a parent, we're expecting one thing, you finally get used to that one thing, and then you change again. You know, it can be frustrating. If parents feel um, that they can be listened to, uh, we're being responsive to them, and if they feel that their child is getting the best education mm -hmm. possible, ultimately, um, I think that will rule the day. You know, when school systems change superintendents, a lot of times the vision for the school system also changes, but Ernest Winston says he was part of putting together the current vision, the one that CMS has been working under for the last couple of years. So expect some tweaks, but no major changes that the goals they have had at CMS are the goals they will have at CMS going forward. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. The latest numbers from Charlotte Mecklenburg schools show the graduation rate for all students is 85.4%, but end of grade testing show only about half of graduates are ready for college and career in basics, including reading, English, and math. Well, back before the days of cell phones, police interactions with the public were rarely seen, but these days it seems everyone has a cell phone and law enforcement encounters are often caught on camera. Charlotte Mecklenburg police have come under a lot of scrutiny because of this. Carolina Impact Jason Terzas introduces us to some CMPD officers making it their mission to bridge the communication gap with the public and create more positive interactions. It's a scene being played out far too often on America's streets. Police involved shootings. Did you shoot him? Did you shoot him? Whether a shooting is considered justified or not, distrust between law enforcement and the people they serve is at a tipping point. It is an all too familiar story in a new setting. This time, the city of Charlotte is on edge, awaiting a second night of protests over the police killing of a black man. With violence towards police officers rising, respect, it seems, from both sides is deteriorating. And because so many people only deal with us in a time of crisis or they get pulled over, um, and that's their interaction. Just like many law enforcement agencies nationwide, Charlotte Mecklenburg police are facing an uphill battle in terms of public perception. If you don't have interactions with police outside of crisis, then you don't have, you may not have you know, a positive view 
of police. That's why within each of CMPD's 13 patrol divisions, there are designated community coordinators, roughly 70 in all. Their job isn't to answer 911 calls or issue traffic tickets, but instead get to know the people who live and work in their area and hopefully build relationships with them. Really what we're trying to do is bridge the gap. We're trying to bridge the gap between the community and the police department. With nearly 40 years combined experience, officers Chad Webster and Jason Peets work the University City area. Some people may be like, you know, why are, why are you, you know, why would you do have police officers doing things that you don't need cops to do? You know, reaching out to schools and, and engaging the community on a non-enforcement level. But that's exactly why we need it. The guys have spearheaded multiple programs, all with the idea of changing people's mindsets about police. It's just you have to put a human side to that uniform. Because if you don't do that, then I think it, it affects public trust. We're trying to get people on that bell curve, not the outliers that think police can do no wrong or will always hate police. We're trying to get these people in here that fall on either side to say, hey, listen, we're not, um, we're not out here to hurt people. We signed up to help people. And here's a kind of a different, unique perspective of two guys that are cops. One initiative they started is called Waves of Change, with Jason, Chad, and other community coordinators simply waving to random people on the street. And you just forget how simple of a gesture that that is. So while we're out patrolling, rolling around, if we wave and they wave back, we get out with them, introduce ourselves. As part of those interactions, the guys hand out goodie bags with Chick-fil-A gift cards and crime prevention tips. We've had those turn into like 15 person you know, little events, you know, that started out as a wave to one person, the neighbors see what's going on, we smile and we wave to them, they come over and we just end up having this, you know, little community engagement party. Jason, Chad, and the other coordinators are also very active in area schools. We probably hit about, about two to 3,000 kids the school year. They read to the kids and talk about the importance of education, but the main reason they go is to win trust. There was one particular class that that they went into when they walked in, you know, some of the kids like scurried to the corner crying because they were terrified of why they were there. And by the end, they were hugging them and begging them not to leave. And at the end of the little session we have with them, we give them a stuffed animal. We call it their reading buddy. And then we try to encourage them to read outside of school, read over the summer and read to their reading buddy out loud. And when it comes to reading, Chad practices what he preaches. As a sixth grader, one of his goals was to become an author. And he's done just that, writing two children's books, Mystery Muffin and Soda Pop Sleuth, The Ghost of Cripplers Creek in 2017, and The Legend of Mr. Creepy in 2018. I guess it's a kind of unique thing where we hear about a, a police officer that writes children's books. He's a really great dad and he's really great at getting on the kids level and being able to explain things to them in a way that doesn't make them feel talked down to. I want kids to want to read and I hoped that I could write something that would that would do that. As part of the school visits, the guys will sometimes bring along Frankie and Sergeant Snuggles, their therapy pigs, as part of the bacon response team. When he came up with the pigs idea, yeah, at first I'm thinking, uh, yeah, that's that's out there. You know, a lot of people will refer to um, cops in a derogatory term as, as a pig. So we're taking that head on. And in keeping with their cop pig theme, Jason and Chad started a monthly podcast called Please Pass the Bacon. Friday podcast day. We wanted to start telling good police stories about interesting people, about atypical police officers. Chad and Jason were among the CMPD officers recently recognized for their service to the community, and they've received donations from the likes of the Panthers and Walmart to help fund their efforts. The fact that I'm in a position where I can make a difference in that way it is great. So whether it's waving, giving away goodies, visiting schools, or doing podcasts, the goal is ultimately the same, to gain trust and bridge the communication gap with the community. And in today's times, those little deeds might go a long way. For Caroline Impact, I'm Jason Churzis reporting. It's great to see those positive interactions with our police force. Thanks so much, Jason, for sharing that story. Well, it's been said jazz was born in our country and embodies the American spirit. But jazz has an old soul. It's the music so many of us love, and the greats like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and Miles Davis created the iconic memories of that music. Here in Charlotte, there's a program designed not only to preserve the legacy of jazz, but also to encourage the next generation of jazz artists. 
Carolina Impact's B. Thompson tells us more. I've been listening to jazz. All I do, I eat, breathe, sleep jazz. Not what you'd expect to hear from a high school student, but listen closely. I'm just fooling myself. And you'll hear the sound of the next generation falling for an American musical genre. Meet Olivia, daughter of a musician band director, the kid who played piano at three, but wasn't sure about music for her future. Yet somehow jazz and the bass found her, something that began as an act of musical rebellion. But then I felt like this strong urge to music, like I had to do something, so I chose orchestra, and um, nobody was playing the bass. Olivia's musical family provided her first introduction to jazz. The influence can be found throughout this teen's room, and that jazz seed well, it's been watered through an organization called Jazz Arts Charlotte. When the bug really hit me was Preservation Hall came last Christmas to Charlotte and did a workshop with Jazz Arts. This is where budding jazz musicians get to learn from the best at a jazz camp. It's the outgrowth of Jazz Arts Charlotte, a nonprofit that began a decade ago, focusing on music education and musician support. We realized that there were no programs that supported specifically uh, jazz education. Uh, there were no programs here that brought musicians together. And we were also looking for ongoing quality jazz performance. I've learned so much about jazz, jazz history, uh, music theory. Um, you name it, I've learned it um, at this camp. These emerging talents learn the rhyme and the reason behind the music. And for Armand, it brings a different feel to how he plays the French horn. Especially jazz, you know, the way that you improvise, um, it keeps you on your feet um, and it helps me to um, understand the world in a different way. Um, whether I'm you know, talking to somebody or whether I'm um, doing something at school, um, music has always helped me um, be able to um, think in different ways. The Jazz Academy programs includes jazz in schools, a youth ensemble, workshops, and the chance for students to perform with world-renowned musicians like sax man Steve Wilson. To get them early, to get them involved and to have programs like this get them involved, bring the music to the communities, take the music to them. The onus is on us now. Summer workshops are followed by after-school sessions during the year. The music camp provides a setting for the kids to learn the art and craft of jazz from its African-American roots to its historical impact. For example, um, Cannonball Adderley, Mercy Mercy Me, they start talking at the beginning about adversity. So they're talking about segregation during the time and you can hear the oppression in the music. And then John Coltrane comes out with all this crazy stuff and it's like you can hear the freedom, how he's like, I'm not gonna be bound to this. We have a future and these students, they have a voice and they have something to say. So we want to give them the vehicle and the tools um, so that they can express themselves through our music. And this is the result. Several jazz art students are now in college and playing professionally. It's the sound Jazz Art Charlotte is helping to grow. As for the high school kid who was a rebel on her own about music, well, she now wants to teach jazz because, as she put it, it is such a gift to America. So we had to ask the question, just what does jazz mean to you? To me, Jazz is not only an American art form, but it's an African-American art form. And being an African-American girl, it's the way that I connect with my culture, and it's the way that I feel in touch with who I am. And that's a wrap. For Carolina Impact, I'm Beatrice Thompson reporting. Thanks so much, B. Those kids really seem passionate about their music. Well, Jazz Arts Charlotte welcomes students at all levels with at least one year of experience in a school band or private lessons. Auditions are held and there is a scholarship program available. For more information, please head to our website at pbscharlotte.org and go to our Carolina Impact page. We're about to introduce you to something that is part art, 
part religion, part foreign language, part history, and very popular here in Charlotte. The students at this Indian Dance Academy are girls to grandmas. Carolina Impact's Suzanne Stevens shows us the intriguing appeal of this highly ritualistic dance. This is Bollywood, or is it? It actually is, brought to you by students at an Indian Dance Academy in South Charlotte. What looks so glitzy and glam actually starts here. I can help my kids to stay connected to their culture, learn a d discipline, as well as serve the community because I always tell them that it is not important to be happy yourself. You have to give that happiness to others. Ritu Mukherjee is a dance guru. Really, that's her title. She's a guruji, which means master elder teacher. She was born in Bengal and worked all the way through her master's degree in zoology, but then left the sciences for the arts. She became certified in Indian classical dance before moving to the States in 2001. Double classical double dance from double Northern double India specializes in footwork and high-speed turns. Yet Ritu teaches a lot more than movement. Start with basics like the floor, which is sacred. Take the blessings of the floor just to show respect to the floor that we'll be dancing on you, so be with us and make our performance successful. And what about the feet on the floor? They are adorned in bells called gungru. The girls learn the art of tying them. The more bells, the more experienced the dancer. Show me a sand. Hand and finger movements are extremely important in Indian dance. The hands take on characters to tell a story. This is a bee, a madhumakshi. This is a fish, matsa. This is a rajans, a swan and there is lots and lots of ritual. Bless you. The classes are of course based on Hindu and Indian ritual, yet they are surprisingly multicultural. We met a Muslim family completely comfortable with the art form. It's times are modern and I'm kind of like, your religion is with you and it's not they're breaking their religion, they're continuing their religion and also they're learning something. Her daughters wanted to take dance after they saw a Bollywood movie. Is it hard? Yeah, some of them. <laughs> what's, what's, uh, what's the best part about the class? Being able to make friends here and learning something new about different cultures. Speaking of different cultures, listen closely to this. Yes, that is Spanish music. Ritu's Indian dance students were invited to perform at an Hispanic festival. Classic Indian dance with Latino music and lyrics. Speaking of diversity, there is age diversity back in the dance One, studio. One, two, three, go. Turn, turn, then we go. Hop, hop. This is an adult class. Hop, hop. There's an engineer, consultant, HR manager, physician, a small business owner, all shiny and shimmying. It's a lot of fun, of course. It's, 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 uh, you saw us, like, it, it's so exciting to be able to dress up, feel like a kid and, and, and dance. I was born and raised in the United States, but being able to connect back to our Indian roots and then for family, you know, we want to make sure that that gets passed on to the next generation. Um, so, so I do it really more for fun. I make a lot of new friends and, you know, I get to perform in front of people, which I love. And you're going to wear your gungrus? This art is intertwined with the Hindu religion. These little girls are beginners on day one. They see a statue of Lord Shiva, the god of dance, and their guru chants prayers. We believe that God comes live on stage over there to bless them with a good life ahead. And both palms and they dance and they take- For all the serious talk, there okay. are plenty of hugs and smiles and giggling amongst the goings on. The guru cultivates genuine affection and the traditions are the same. Nobody taught Kathak or Bollywood. People always thought, oh, Bollywood is just freestyle dancing. Anybody can do, just move your hands and that's called Bollywood dancing. But it is actually technique. Dance is all about technique and orientation. And today I have 250 students who are learning this art form for me. As the children grow up, stepping from one year into another, learning an ancient art form that crosses the centuries, the ocean, and the many cultures here in Charlotte. For Carolina Impact, I'm Suzanne Stevens reporting.
Those ladies can dance. Well, thanks so much, Suzanne. There are many kinds of both classic and folk Indian dancing. The Indian dance schools in Charlotte each specialize in one or more of these traditions. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.